Hello everybody, Joel here again with As It Is Written. Today we're going to be talking about the Kingdom of God. Um, again, I have been addressing slowly um, the viewpoint of the dispensationalist. <clears throat> I used to be a dispensationalist, uh, so I, I'm very familiar with the argumentation, uh, the verses, the proof text that they go to for making the argument that the Bible teaches dispensational theology. Um, but when I removed myself from being under certain types of teachers and began to study the Bible for myself, I could no longer see dispensationalism as a legitimate teaching. In fact, it, it seems to be employing um, the use of eisegesis constantly, cherry-picking scriptures and taking them out of their context. Uh, so one of the things I wanted to discuss today would be in regards to the kingdom of God, many, not all, but most dispensationalists will tell you that the kingdom of God or the gospel of the kingdom was something that was a gospel specific to the Jewish people, to Israel. Um, <clears throat> that this is something that was put on hold. Uh, they, they would tie this in with the 70, 70th week prophecy in Daniel. Uh, they tie it to Jacob's trouble, the Great Tribulation. All of this would be at the end of human history, the last seven years of human existence before Christ's return. Uh, and they would say that the gospel, since the, the Jewish people rejected their Messiah and rejected the kingdom, that it was put on hold. And so God did this. Uh, now, they'd never say it this way, but essentially God had a plan B um, to bring in the Gentiles and establish the church, which would be indistinct from Israel uh, in any way, which is problematic because you have to stop and think uh, who were the foundational pieces of the beginning of the church. It was specifically the Jewish people. Uh, so that doesn't work at all in any way. Um, that's not the topic I want to get into right this second, <clears throat> but does the Bible actually teach us that the kingdom of God, or the gospel of the kingdom as they like to say it, was that specifically to the, the Israelites or the Jews? Well, <clears throat> Jesus himself does not ever say that, neither do the apostles. We're, we're going to dive here into Matthew 21. Uh, this is starting in verse 33. He said, Here another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Now, when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render to him the fruit in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls it will grind him to powder. Now, when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. Now here, <clears throat> we have this parable of the vine dresser. And when he sent his servants to go and gather the fruit, they were attacked, beaten, killed. <clears throat> this happened a couple times until the vine dresser sent his son. Uh, <clears throat> or the owner of the vineyard, uh, sent his son to the vine dressers. Now, it is obvious, and I don't think anyone would disagree with this, that the son in this parable is Jesus. And when he ca came, they acknowledge him as the heir of the kingdom. Okay, 
Uh, this would be similar to in Daniel's prophecy when he's referred to as Messiah the Prince. So when he comes, they say, come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. In another place, uh, Jesus would describe this group of people in his time, the Israelites, the Jewish people who rejected him. He would describe them as those who did not desire to have someone reign over them. They did not want Jesus to reign over them. So instead, they laid their hands on him and killed him. <clears throat> so these are taken out. They're cast out of the vineyard and killed. Uh, they, sorry, they took him, Messiah the Prince, Jesus, cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. So when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do? They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vineyards who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. Now, Jesus quotes Psalm 118 about the stone the builders rejecting has become the chief cornerstone. And then he says, therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you. Okay, so we're talking about the kingdom of God. Jesus has been preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He's speaking of the kingdom of God. He's saying this kingdom, the kingdom of God will be taken from you. Who's the you? The Jewish people who rejected him and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. So he's telling them it's going to go from Jew to Gentile. And whoever falls on the stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now, this is a connection to Daniel's, um, well, the dream interpretation that Nebuchadnezzar had in Daniel chapter 2 that Daniel interpreted for him. <clears throat> so, if we go and look at that prophecy, Daniel says, You, O king, were watching, and behold a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut without human hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together it became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, th this is an obvious parallel. The stone not cut with human hands is Christ. Christ came and <clears throat> the kingdoms of the world, the kingdoms of the devil, he crushed. He crushed by the crushing of his own body on the cross. He took back what was lost. He redeemed fallen creation through the shedding of his blood. He redeemed us and essentially made things like death and sin to be powerless. Um, <clears throat> when the image is crushed, it becomes like chaff. All right. So back in Matthew 21, he says, whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. So Jesus is the chief cornerstone, the stone that the builders rejected. He is the stone cut without human hands that strikes the image. It strikes anyone who comes against God and against his Christ, and it grinds them to powder. They will be destroyed. But the ones who believe, whoever falls on the stone will be broken. They will be caused to repent. The, the stone, when you believe in Christ, you will see the reality of your sin. You will see your brokenness, your need for salvation. You will be broken upon him. But that will draw you to repentance and salvation. But the one who rejects is going to be destroyed. Now, we have a um, <clears throat> parallel passage over in Luke 14 where the people are talking about... Um, <clears throat> well, it says one of the people who sat at the table with him heard these things he was speaking of. He said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Jesus responds saying, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. 
But they, with, they all with one accord began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground. I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I am going to test them. I ask that you have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. Now, pause here for a second. <clears throat> Jesus came. Now, before Jesus came, actually, John the Baptist came preaching and calling the sinners to repent. Now, the, the proud religious scribes and Pharisees rejected his message, but the very people who ended up coming were those who were the poor, the maimed, the lame, and the blind. And when, when Christ comes, these are the people he's taking compassion on. He's healing the, the, you know, the sick from city to city. He's casting out the demon-possessed. He's taking pity on the poor and the needy, the orphans and the widows. These are the people he is looking at because all throughout Jesus' ministry, he, he makes mention of, you know, through parable after parable the importance of being humble and the, the great error of being prideful. So the servant said, Master, it is done as you, as you commanded, and still there is room. Then the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Now because of the rejection of uh, Israel, of the Jews, predominantly they rejected. There were quite a few that, that ended up accepting Christ as Messiah, and that's wonderful. <clears throat> but the majority of them rejected him. Uh, so the gospel of the kingdom, the invitation to come into the wedding feast, to come into the banquet, uh, to take part in the kingdom of God that he is establishing, that invitation ended up going out into the highways uh, and the hedges, basically out into the Gentile world. So they're, they're all being invited in because of the hardening and rejection of the Jewish people. Um, now, th this is especially important because back in Daniel's prophecy or the interpretation of the vision in Daniel 2, uh, when it's talking about the feet and the toes that was iron mixed with ceramic clay, um, it says, in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Now, what did Jesus come preaching? The gospel of the kingdom. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdoms of this world is not a single kingdom of this world has endured forever. Uh, if you think rationally about any king kingdom in this world, they all have boundaries. They all have a, a set place. And, and yes, they may do some conquering. They may ex expand their territories here and there through war. But ultimately, we can draw the boundary lines <clears throat> of any kingdom in this world. Uh, but Jesus said his kingdom was not of this world. And no one could say, look over there. There it is. Or come here, here it is. It, it's a spiritual kingdom. It's an invisible kingdom uh, to the naked eye. The kingdom of God is the people of God. It is the church. <clears throat> and so this prophecy or interpretation of the vision is fulfilled in Jesus establishing the church and sending out his apostles to preach the gospel. And as they're drawing in the Jews first, and then upon the rejection, it going out to the Gentiles, the promise to Abraham way back when that through his seed, being Christ, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. And we're seeing this come true as we're reading through the gospel accounts and Jesus coming as the king. Every kingdom needs a king. When the king came and was rejected, the gospel went out to the nations. All the nations of the earth were blessed, are blessed, in Christ. <clears throat> and so, as in the days of the kings of the iron mixed with clay, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. That's the church. 
You can't destroy it. And Jesus said, of his church, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Continuing in Daniel, it says, Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. This dream is certain, and its interpretation is true. We have no reason to doubt this dream, this interpretation. This is just one piece stacked upon another and another and another that shows us that the Bible is true. When, when God promises something, he will deliver. We have prophecy after prophecy that has been fulfilled. God has never lied. He has never failed to accomplish his promises. So when we look at this all together, we see that Daniel 2 is pointing to the time of Christ's coming when Messiah the Prince would come and establish his kingdom that would never end. In fact, it doesn't just not end it, it breaks apart the other kingdoms and consumes them. That stone, as we read in Daniel 2, it grows into a mighty mountain. Now, the mountain consumes the whole earth. That means people from all over the, uh, all over the earth are going to be brought into this kingdom. And that is the church people. When Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom, he's talking about the kingdom of God which we see in places like Daniel, that was a prophecy hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ came. He set up that kingdom, and ever since, what has been happening? The apostles went out, and they started preaching the gospel. People came into the kingdom of God through belief. <clears throat> when the apostles started to die off, and, and the the gospel was predominantly in the hands of Gentiles. What has happened ever since? For the past 2,000 years, the gospel continues to be preached and people continue to come in to the kingdom of God. See, this is a kingdom that will never be shaken. It will never come to an end. It, it only grows. It's become a mighty mountain that spreads throughout the whole earth. So when people say that Jesus preached one gospel and then Paul came along preaching another gospel, no. No, 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 no. The gospel has been the same from the beginning. From Genesis, the promise to the, the serpent that through the woman's seed, uh, that he would crush the serpent's head and the serpent would bruise his heel. To Abraham, that through your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Moses speaks of a prophet greater than himself that would come, that the people would listen to. And, and over and over and over again, the, the whole entirety of the scriptures is pointing to Messiah the Prince, Jesus Christ, Yeshua. This is the central focal point of the gospel, Jesus. And for some reason, the dispensationalists want to make the central focal point of prophecy about Israel the nation. It is not. We see very clearly in the New Testament teachings that only those who believe will be saved. If you're not believing, you're not part of the promises. If you have rejected God, there are only promises of destruction and condemnation. We're not seeing two different gospels here. We're seeing Jesus came preaching that he is the fulfillment. I'm here. I've come to fulfill these prophecies. Believe. The people did not believe. So the gospel went out to the Gentiles and they were brought in to that very same kingdom that was being preached. Now there's more I could say on this and I'm going to do more videos here in the future that will talk more and more about this topic. But this is just a few little pieces that I really want anyone who listens to this video to seriously think about these things. I know I was in dispensational churches for most of my life. I know what they say. I know the arguments they use. I know why they think that they're right. You know, they, they have been taught that if you say that the true Israel is the church, that somehow you're, you're speaking blasphemy, okay? But we, we don't need to employ thought-stopping devices whenever someone has a legitimate question or... Um, 
is picking up on something in the scriptures and you're like, whoa, 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 don't go there. No, no, no. Let's let people actually read the Bible for themselves and study it and ask the right questions and see what God is actually trying to reveal because this gospel of the kingdom is the invitation to come into eternal life with Christ. It is the gospel of grace. Jesus is the gift of grace. And we accept them through faith. So, don't believe the dispensational teachers. Don't, let me rephrase. Don't blindly believe them. Okay? It, what I want everyone to be able to do is to think about these things on a real intellectual level instead of just regurgitating the teachings of a man. There, there's a lot of people where dispensationalism has become the popular teaching of uh, today in the church. Now, popularity does not equate accurateness. It doesn't mean they're right. And in fact, prior to the 1800s, people were not teaching dispensationalism. Nobody was. So these are things that we really ought to seriously engage with because if they're wrong, there's great error there. Very great error. And we need to consider these things. So we're going to I'm going to be doing some more videos on this topic getting a little bit more into it each time and what I'm hoping to do is just put you know little pieces of the puzzle um for a few minutes at a time in a video and then when I've kind of gotten through all my different thoughts and the different um arguments that I want to engage with I would like to go back and do it just an extended video, a, a long one, talking about all the points of dispensationalism and how the Bible actually disagrees with them. The Bible contradicts dispensationalism, and I'm I'm 99.99% sure that's the truth. Um, but until next time, just think about these things. Let let not just my words. Let the Bible sit in your mind and cause you to really think about these things deeply. Uh, pray about it. Ask the Spirit to teach you. Um, don't let any any one man or even ten men be your primary teacher, but let the Holy Spirit teach you through the Scriptures. Uh, pray and ask God for clarity. And until next time, God bless. I'll see you in the next video.